Your Honor. Good morning once again. Today is December 27, 2020. Uh, I think next year is going to be very interesting. So, we're having a Christmas today at my daughter's house with the kids because uh, just because of the other in laws or outlaws, whatever you want to call them, they, you know, they take a turn with the kids. And this, we're, we're excited. Um, uh, we have a lot of, they barely fit into the bad house that we have for the kids, you know. Let's clever up their house now, you know, see what, you know, give them all these things that they're going to have to sell in the garage sale or give away, you know. Everybody loves doing that. Um, all right, today is the lesson number 63 in First Thessalonians. Thessalonians. Let me read you the First Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 6. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before, and you know, were shamefully entreated. As you know of Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. For neither at any time used to we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men so with glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this um, for this message and for the words you, you teach to us that that gives us a common sense, gives us a view of the world that we never had before. We understand that we're basically citizens of heaven and we're here down here temporarily. And just that piece of information alone makes a lot of sense in this present evil world. The one thing I pray for for New Year's is that we all stay fixed on giving the gospel as best we can in whatever situation we're in. Um, that's the you couldn't ask for a better way to finish the end of your life by doing this. So I just thank you for this in Son's name. Amen. In spite of all the things that happened to Paul, Paul says we were bold. Paul was not naturally bold. People are afraid. They think, am I equipped to give this information? Can I answer opposing questions? Fear and witnessing is common to all. If you're saved, you know how to give the gospel. And I've said recently, um, when I first started to preach, it was just intermittently. Um, I didn't have a regular. And every time before I preached, I always had to go to the bathroom. My body says, everybody out. And that didn't last just a couple times. It lasted for years. I was afraid. Because when we took over the phone calls for Grace School of the Bible, I just finished the course, Grace School of the Bible. It was in, in the March of 1996. And we started getting phone calls. And boy, I don't even say like five years, five, four and a half years. And then I got a call one night on, on a Thursday night about 7.30, a guy from Florida who was putting together a message and he came to a point and he, he couldn't figure out where to go. No, he had been saved for like, he was preaching for about 35 years. He broke. So he asked me the question. Now again, as I said before, has, had he known how long I've been saved, he wouldn't have given any time today. But I had the answer. And it started to lessen my fear as far as, you know, can I answer the questions? And I can count on one hand the number of times I couldn't, but I said, I'll find out the answer for it. And I'm not trying to brag, but I'm, what I'm saying is how effective rightly dividing the truth is the word of truth. When you study the Bible dispensationally, you can answer questions you never thought you could answer. You're prepared. Uh, you might be a little afraid, but 99% of the calls that, that, that we get are people curiously asking, you know, what, what's it? It, it's, it revolves around not rightly dividing the word of truth. They'll, they'll, they'll intermix law with grace. They'll think they can lose their salvation because maybe somebody told them that. And uh, like that 85 year old guy I talked about last session. Church of Christ, they're not secure in salvation. They have probation. So in the throes of his wife, wife's death, she was receiving 
calling her mother to keep her from this place she was headed toward. That literally scared the hell out of the guy, and he, and he started searching around. She died four years ago, and Debbie had to talk, talk to him yesterday. I mean, what an opportunity, you know, to get, to get things like that. Paul would not necessarily go, as I said. Uh, fear and witnessing is common to all. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. It's simple. Christ crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. John says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The power is in the word of God. It's, it's active. It's, 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 it can, you can display it to people when you put it in you and you're dealing with other people. You can display that. You, you learn things that, well, things that everybody should know from when they're growing up. But we live in a, in a kind of like a post-Christian world. All right, it's, it's, it's pretty nasty out there as far as Christianity and what's going on with the world. And it's going to get worse. The thing that we have that other people don't is we know where we are going to spend eternity. Amen. And the most important thing, piece of information to, to think about, I was talking to one of my sisters last night. Um, she got saved later and, and, her, and her children are older. And she's trying to, she, she thinks they're safe, but she's not totally sure, maybe. But there were the two words. I had, a, I had a conversation with a guy last week, 77 years old. He was kind of, he was from the South, one of those fast talking Southerners. And he was uh, cracking a few jokes, you know, I was going along with him and all that. And then um, he started asking me questions I had answers for him. Then his wife got in the car. He says, Ask her how to get saved. So I did, and she brought me to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 4. And then he thought, okay, I'm going to really get this guy now. And he asked me a question, how do you get to, what's the best thing of advice you can give me? I said, two words, final authority. In life, what's your final authority? It's going to be you, your parents, your rabbi, your priest, your, you know, preacher, the pastor, or it's going to be God's word. And with all those kind of Bibles out there, which one can you believe in? Do you have confidence in? So it's, uh, it's interesting. So he didn't talk anymore after that, he had to go. Um, now, compare verse two, let me read it again. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and crucified, with verse six, verse Corinthians two, six. Paul says, how be it we speak wisdom among, among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to none. Now the next two verses give an electrical jolt to those open to the truth. And I'm distinctly remembering my twin sisters, you know, when they when they got a hold of this. I think Mary got it first and then she put it to Terry. And when Terry got this, it was like verse one, first Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world under our glory which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. John 16, 11 says, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. It's Christ talking about Satan. Ephesians 2, 2 says, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Satan's a prince. You read about Christ being a prince in, in Acts, they capitalize the word P, but he's the prince of the world, the prince of the power of the air. He wants the whole, you know, the whole caboodle. Paul could not speak to the Corinthians as spiritual, but as unto babes. He said in chapter 3, 1 to 3, And I, brother, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you milk, I fed you with milk, not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it. 
Did you yet are you did you yet now are you able? For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Now a grown up in the faith it says perfect, it means mature. And then there's there's the grown ups and then there's carnal babes. Milk would be Christ crucified. For the preaching of the cross is to be then that perish foolishness, but unto God, us who, us who are saved, it is the power of God. Let me say that again. For the preaching of the cross is to then that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So if anybody's saved, they know how to give the gospel to somebody to ask them. Okay? Now, the meat is the revelation of the mystery. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now it made manifest. So you got the milk, initial salvation, then you have the meat, rightly divided in the word of truth, the, the revelation of the mystery, the gospel of grace. First Corinthians 2 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. The deep things of God have been revealed. Paul's epistles, Paul named truth. Now, there are other things that are deep in the sense of, well, what, what did I preach last session? What did David do? He wanted to number the people of Israel. He wanted his number because he wanted for his, um, the wrong purpose to brag. You know, look at me, I'm victorious. I killed all my enemies when it was actually the hand of the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 3, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Again, Paul is not naturally bold. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 2. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side, <clears throat> without our fightings and within were fears. His boldness had to come from God. Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for his saints, for all saints. Then he says, pray for me. Now, here's a guy, he's asking people to pray for him. It says in the next verse here, and for me, all right, utterance. He, he was the apostle of the Gentiles. He was the, the, the apostle of the dispensation of grace. He was in the third heaven. He talked to the Lord. The Lord revealed his wisdom from, from the heaven. And he was up in the third heaven one time. And he says, pray for me. And pray for me, Ephesians 6, 19, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, excuse me, to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul is praying for internal fortitude. He sees himself as, Ephesians 3, 8, unto me whom less than the least of all saints. <clears throat> How many have a bit of that in, in yourselves? Less than the least of all saints. Paul was plagued with depression, but he found victory over it by being thankful to God and overcame fear with boldness. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Especially in 2 Corinthians, you see his, his uh, depression. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, let me read you verses 8 through 10. We would not, brethren, have you ignorance of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sen sentence, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who just delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, and whom we trust that he, he will yet deliver us. Now there's three phases there. 
Time passed by now, and to come. All right? He says, delivered us. We've been delivered. We're saved. And doth deliver. He could deliver us from a carnal mind, from carnal thinking. And trust, he will yet deliver us. Well, where are we going when we die? To heaven. Look at chapter 4. Let me read you verses 7 through 12. Second Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, but not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are all way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, so then death worketh in us the life in you. Wow. How to get over stage fright? You have something to say. In the pulpit or one-on-one. -on -one. You have more knowledge than the person you're dealing with. God gives you boldness by your intake of his doctrine. Look at the following passage. Romans 1, 14 and 15. Paul says, I am a debtor both to, to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and unwise. So as much as in me is, where's the focus now? Out or in? I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we were talking about this last week, the judgment seat of Christ. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We know that in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, it says it's the word that worketh effectually in those that believe. But go to Romans chapter 6 and look at verse 17. Romans 6.17. Let me start at verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. We don't, we don't have to allow it to have dominion over us. And an adult would do the right thing. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Here's the verse now. And that's not yet. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Here's the verse. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being that made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Now, if that doesn't give you a, a surge, I don't know what would. Acts 14, 1 says, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude of both the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. Now that's the difference you see in Paul's epistle. He's going to everybody, not just Jews. Where does this boldness come from? 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we are allowed of God, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tried our hearts. So deceit. Flattering words, uncleanness, a cloak of covetousness, guile, nor of men shall we glory. Uncleanness, moral, guile, having an ulterior motive, you keep hidden. It's like the phone calls we get. Somebody asks a question, but they have an ulterior motive. They didn't believe what was preached, they heard on the radio, and they call with a question, but they really have. They want to tell you something that they believe. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. 
Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. How do you look on people before you deal with them? Deal with them. What's your behavior going to be like if you want to give them the gospel? Well, you know, number one, you got to find some way of getting permission. But are you going to be arrogant? You're going to start talking about yourself. This is what happened to me after I was saved. That's being selfish. You're focused on that person and that person only. You're going to try to. Well, let me give you a passage here in Second Timothy chapter two. Two, let me see here. 24 to 26, the last three verses. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. And the word apt means capable. If you're saved, you know how to tell somebody else how to get saved. Why? In meekness and in meekness, instructing those that impose themselves. If God for adventure will give them repentance, that's a change in the mind, to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will, by wrongly dividing the word of truth. You think we're under the kingdom program? You think we're spiritual Israel, spiritual Jews? You're not going to do the person any good. When you do not rightly divide the word, you handle the word of God deceitfully. Now, I'm not trying to get anybody upset. And one of the songs I did was, you know, the ignorant brother go to heaven. And if you're saved today, but you don't know about the dispensation of grace, Paul says you're ignorant, but you can still go to heaven. Okay? Because it's, a, it's the faith of Christ. Um, you will say things like, I've been baptized. I go to church. I'm a good person. I'm a spiritual Jew or Israelite. Things like that. Paul's students taught, God, taught God's word so that just by the manifestation of the truth, it commended itself to every man's conscience. They didn't make up anything or tell anyone how lucky they were to have them as their teachers. We have somebody doing that right now. You're lucky you're my, I'm, I'm your teacher. You know? I would think the opposite. But that's, that's evil. First Thessalonians 2, 5 to 12. For neither at any time used to be flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God's witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, you were willing to have imported of you, imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear to us. This is how Paul viewed the other people. I want them to get out to anything for them to understand that. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preach unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and of God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe. He's talking about behavior. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as the Father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. How does the Father think of his children? Depends on what age they're at. Now, when they're out of the house, how do you think about them? You hope they're doing well. And if they're not doing well, feel a little guilt. Sometimes you can't help it. Once in uh, the biography bi 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 of Paul Newman, and his son, his only son, was trying to be an actor and 
He got hooked up in a drought, and, and he died at 28 of an overdose. And we said, I don't know how I'm going to get rid of the guilt. I don't know how I can, how I can live with the guilt. Now, I'm pretty sure that the kid wasn't saved. I don't think Luma was either. But what he ended up doing, he, he started a foundation, Scott Newman decided to help people having trouble. He made foods that, people, that they still sell today that goes to charity and things like that, you know. Um, that's all well and good, but what's the reality of that? Does that get you to happen? He might have had some guilt, maybe felt he was gone too often, do, doing pictures and movies and all that. And, but, he didn't understand it. I hope he did, but I don't think he did. Um, if he did, he wasn't talking about it. That's the most important thing, is you're gonna die and where are you gonna spend eternity? Now, other religions will whack you with guilt and you know keep you off balance so, they, so that they can control you. God says to study to show thyself. The T's, anything with a T is singular. Be thou life, singular. You, individually, make up your own mind. So, well, neither did we use flattering words, he says, a cloak of covetousness, of men's selfie, of men's selfie glory slash reputation. This is a description, description of religion. Paul says he did not come in with any of these. He says, we were allowed of God. Does God need you? No. What did I just, what did I just read in 2 Samuel 7, last session? God, David got this idea, okay. He's gathering all these materials. He wanted to build the Lord a house. Do I need a house as the Lord? I don't need a house. I made the world. What are you thinking of? And the first Nathan the prophet said, go ahead and do it. And God says, no. He's not understanding something. He wanted to live in a human tent. Human, he wanted to be live in the house of Israel. But to build him a house, a cathedral, get all this money, and you know, show off. No. It's not right. God will get his work done with or without you. How's that sound? He will take care of it. His word has existed for thousands of years. He has taken care of that. I do not have to produce anything. All I have to do is proclaim his word. Paul did not use flattering words to get financial gain, but he understood that religion does, as scripture reveals. Paul says in Galatians 1 verse 10, for do I not persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. What pleases men in religion? Big crowds. Thousands of people coming to your church. Multi-million dollar entertainment budgets and things like that. Galatians 1, 13 and 14. Paul says, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Now, I, I love that word zealous because it triggers a passage in my mind, Romans 10, 1 to 4. That uses the word righteousness four times. Brethren, Paul says in Romans 10, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Wait a minute, they're Jews. I thought they were God's chosen people. Don't they get in just because they're Jews? No. In this passage, Paul was really willing to trade his own salvation, which you can't do, for that of his nation. He felt for them. Bad. He knew they had the wrong things. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That sums up Israel. Remember, I said, read the description before the law, after the law of Israel, the way God thinks about Israel and what they did? I'm not against the Jews. 
I'm not, I'm not an anti-Semite. I'm against Satan. And I'm against hell. And I don't want to see anybody go to hell, whether they're Muslim or Jew. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Do you think that understanding the law is a really a good thing to know, know about? Do you think the difference between law and grace is something that every Christian should have? The rightly dividing the word of truth is something they need to do. If you think that way, you're going to be more and more emboldened to go to more, most more people, hopefully. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that worketh or believeth. He says, believe it. We were watching that It's a Wonderful Life, James Stewart, and uh, I've never seen the beginning. In the beginning, there's like a, a sky, you get the bedroom falls, and talking about the stallion. But then you're up in the, in, in the universe in the sky, and God is talking to somebody else about the sky down there. Jimmy Stewart that wants, you know, he wants to jump in the river and commit suicide. And they're talking about there's Clarence, the guy that came down. Clarence didn't have his wings yet. Angel has wings. Well, he's got to do something else and he'll get his wings. Well, that's wrong right there. But then they said something, he's got to do a good job in order to get that. That's worse right there. I mean, strike two before you get into the movie. You know, it's still a cute movie, but it's, you know. Jesus Christ says the following to the Jews before his death, burial, and resurrection. John 5, 44. How can you believe which receiveth, which receive honor of one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? There he is in the flesh, his earthly ministry, just how stubborn can man be? He takes and puts on a silver platter, offers it to Israel, and they don't get it. They don't want it. They kill him. John 5, 46 to 47. For had he even believed Moses, he would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if he believed not his writings, how shall you believe not my words? Now notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Chapter 11, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. According to Scripture, to be in Christ, who do we have to follow in order to get life everlasting? In heaven. Paul, well, right? He says in 1 Timothy 1 16, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first? Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to a life everlasting. Me first. Did Peter, James, and John come before Paul in the scripture? Yes. Did they preach a gospel? Yes. What was that gospel called? The gospel of the kingdom. They were here during the earthly ministry of Christ. They were still under the law. And yet God still sought to give more information to a guy by the name of Saul, whose Gentile name was Paul, save him on, on the road to Damascus, and usher in a different dispensation, who wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books. Is that important to know that? Why? Wouldn't curious minds want to know? Paul continues in Galatians 5.11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross cease. The cross is offensive to people who think they are helping God. Religionists. 1 Corinthians 2 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Paul practiced what he preached. He didn't pull any punches, so to speak. We were at Sherwood yesterday, and we put them in. I had to go there to copy the Xerox and papers. And we were on our way to, to Rick's house because she had made lasagna. Rick's alone, he's bashing it right now. His wife is in Arizona with the kids. And I just forgot what I was going to say. 
I'm that age. Anyway, we went to Rick's house and we had a good talk. Paul didn't pull any punches. In other words, he wasn't nasty. He wasn't rude. He wasn't offensive. He just gave the truth. What happens when you give somebody the truth today? They become your enemy. And I become your enemy because I tell you the truth. I got to talk that quicker than normal these days. So, he says in 1 Corinthians 121, for after that in the wisdom of God, after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew God, knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.10, we are fools for Christ's sake. But ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. So it says, apostles were fools, we're weak, and we are despised. How many Christian preachers and pulpits today on a Sunday do you think are preaching those words to their congregation? Am I offending, am I offending anybody here? No. Is this the truth that I'm talking about? Now, sea changes are taking place in our world. This is big changes. Europe will probably be Muslim ruled by 2030 because the Muslim population is growing quickly. But Christianity will not end until Jesus Christ comes. Acts 11:26. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. There were no Christians in Abraham's day. And there were no body of Christ Christians at Pentecost. The body of Christ belongs to the Lord and he will take care of it. The church will move on whether we continue or not. But we have been allowed to be entrusted with the gospel. We are privileged to be able to participate in God's plan. The part we have been entrusted, the part we have been entrusted with is to go out and tell people about him. His goodness, his good news concerning his son. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ allows us to offer life instead of death righteousness in place of sin and justification in place of guilt we get this exclusively in Jesus Christ now just a couple of days for the new year to begin let's make a resolution to keep our minds on what he did for mankind we are overcome with this with his gift and kindness to the world amen thank you Seventy-seven. Mm -hmm.